low. All right. One of our issues that I believe is the most important of our century is human trafficking. And the issues of human trafficking deal with child abduction, deals with the classically uh, tailored um, money earning relations dealing with pimping like in Chicago or New Jersey or New York um, smuggling cocaine in a little girl's jiny from I don't know Cuba into Florida or um, Tijuana Mexico into San Diego, California. These have been uh, traditionally known when it comes to sexual exploitation and it falls under human trafficking. Um, sex trade, slave labor, people working for free, being promised jobs in America or even while they're in America uh, guaranteed employment and then it's free free work and it's slave labor and there's rape and drugs and sex and these things are against the will of some kids or even adults and human trafficking has got to be probably more important than even things like women's rights to get an abortion or uh, gay marriage. Human trafficking is a very ancient process among any socioeconomic status, race, jurisdiction, and profession and industry. They say that prostitution is the oldest profession known to man. It's actually human trafficking. Human trafficking was discovered centuries ago when man learned that he could domesticate animals and get free labor out of the domestication of animals and his livestock. And when he learned that he could get free work out of the domestication of animals, he then began domesticating women and children. And then human trafficking, sexual exploitation and sexual violence trickled from out of that. Human trafficking is probably an equal or more so of an issue than things like animal cruelty. Animal cruelty is of course the domestication and exploitation of animals. But um, people have been treated like animals. And so in the realm of human trafficking and the umbrella, that includes child abduction, it includes pimping, prostitution, pornography, a lot of different manifestations that is um, under the umbrella of human trafficking so happens to be from humans 
being treated like animals. I just got back from a fantastic lecture at UCSB, that's University of California, Santa Barbara. And UCSB has a particularly known political climate next to all of Santa Barbara. And if you want to study psychology at the UC system and you choose UCSB, you're going to probably be disappointed because there's no windows and they test on rats and animals. And it's not quite the psychology that maybe you want to um, become an expert in. And so some students can't handle UCSB, the psychology department, because of the, the angle of psychological testing that occurs, opposed to other UC campuses like UC San Diego, or UC Santa Cruz, or even UC Berkeley, or UC Davis, or any of the UCs. UCSB is um, not liked for very many people, pardon me, because um, UCSB is well funded, and it's because of the military industrial criminal complex that studies missiles as um, an institution that needs to uh, be at the forefront of study. So any type of lecturers that come through UCSB, this one happens to be Martina Vandenberg, and she's done a lot of work with Human Rights Watch and um, International Labor Organization, and right now she um, is um, pretty marvelous. She is the um, founder and president of the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center in Washington, D.C., and has spent nearly two decades fighting human trafficking, forced labor, rape as war crime, and violence against women. She has represented victims of human trafficking pro bono in immigration, criminal, and civil cases, widely regarded as an expert on an array of human rights issues. She has testified before the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Human Rights and the Law, the Helsinki Commission, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Armed Services Committee. During her four years as a Human Rights Watch researcher, she authored two reports on forced prostitution and rape in Bosnia and um, other places. And so um, she's a scholar and she's received several awards that are very prestigious. And she's also an attorney. So I attended this uh, fantastic lecture held at, held and presented by the Walter H. Capp Center for Study of Ethics, Religion, Public Life at UCSB. And this event was co-sponsored by Education Abroad Program and Human Rights Watch. Um, the Capp Center is um, organized by our Congresswoman Lois Capps in the state of California. And so um, dealing with ethics, religion, and public life, uh, this was a, a marvelous um, lecture. Now, I'd like to share some of the notes. Um, when I first walked into the lecture, um, I, I found a very disgusting vibe coming into the, um, it's the Corwin Pavilion and um, the auditorium. And it was well attended. There were five rows in the front with three sections and the middle section had the, the longest in um, 
in length for seats. And I didn't count the specific seats, but there are five rows going back. And it was um, dispersed through three sections, with the middle section being the largest reserved for interested wealthy patrons, administrators, and wealthy loan hands from throughout uh, different sectors represented in Santa Barbara County. There was a thick air of folks of entitlement and a scary face and eyes with fat stomachs and well-dressed people with no humanistic connection essentially in the aura but boundaries to protect one's wealth. And there was a democratic spirit, of course, because of the topic, but something about it was very white, Reaganomics, and very Republican, and greedy and corrupt. There was a connection from apprehending by knowing what it feels like to be poor and homeless versus being wealthy and not getting your hand um, dirty. The crowd had an alarming, radiant formality of power, lies, business smarts, of course, greed and corruption, plus a gambling privilege and superficiality, moneyed conservativeness that really supported labor. There was something that I believe to understand the mindset and the heart of human trafficking, one has to know poverty and be poor. It's just my feeling. Um, because of the power elite structure and talks of conspiracy theorists dealing with the social relevancy of a new world order, an Illuminati, a shadow government, Bilderberg, the Bohemian Club, or the Bohemian Grove, um, Freemasonry, Mormons, um, KKK, assassinations of world leaders. And so um, when you take a topic specifically like human trafficking where political leaders and very wealthy uh, power elite have uh, access to human trafficking rings for their own enjoyment illegally, where also law enforcement has been known to infiltrate drugs and prostitutes in certain counties throughout uh, California even. When embracing such topic as human trafficking, it, it has a large scope that is pertinent to the poor person that is an expert on the topic because they know the streets and they've been there and they understand the life. So when you go into a lecture on human trafficking and everybody looks moneyed and affluent and well-to-do, you as the social observant participatory human subject of the specific lecture may very well be taken back. And this is a very, uh, human thing that you may face. Notwithstanding the sociologist and the social scientist and the political scientist needs to be non-biased. So it took a lot for me to um, take down my own mask and see my own prejudice and to see my own wanting to be um, above the waters with my head. and be afloat in a system where um, I know how to handle my own finance and things like that. There were some myths that were introduced and um, you may want to pick up the book. It's called Think Again by David A. Feingold. Human Trafficking, Think Again. And uh, the lecture really related that it's really exposed. And because what I point uh, us into the direction of 
specifically that was not um, regarded as important as I think it ought to be, you know, through this lecture. But technology and how it's become a distraction. We're all on our, you know, you know, iPads or our iPhones or you know, text messaging, and so when we go into public, it's like a tunnel vision. And we're only looking at our business because it's a culture of narcissism and finding ways to make money using technology, which is the new jobs. Apple and things like that, 2013. And so um, when we go into the public sector, we don't notice what's happening among uh, rich people and poor people walking in and the clothing and the behavior that may very well be suspicious. If we knew how to identify, we could, uh, you know, make a police report. In this way, I want the police to be very supported. I, I don't want to um, create a dog tail out of the police and law enforcement agencies and even the attorneys, even though there has been sightings of sexual exploitation conducted by by uh, organized crime um, where these entities um, battle against being held guilty and they are held guilty. Um, why I am standing by law enforcement um, is because when you have a, a, uh, a depiction of a human trafficking ring and it's made visible in society. You have no place to go. You can't go to clergy because they're busy being pedophiles. Really can't go to the gay culture because they want to be the role model or the the um, the mentor or the daddy figure, and then they want to molest the children. So you don't really quite know where to go in the trauma. And we do have a legal system and a Department of Justice and I can go ahead and expand more on that, where options have been provided for you if you are concerned. One of the questions that is might be going on in, in, in the viewer's mind as I'm um, lecturing on this is, well, what can we do? Well, not be afraid to talk about this. Um, specifically, the last 20 years, we've come so far among uh, women, CASA, California um, Association, you know, for the sexually assaulted Latino women moved this CASA movement in California along. And huge strides have been made. Um, 20 years ago, you couldn't go to a cafe and talk about rape and domestic violence. Today, you can. And, uh, you know, nobody's really going to look over their shoulder. However, the new taboo, the taboo word for modern contemporary society based off of technological advancement is human trafficking. When you discuss human trafficking in public, it's frightening, it's scary, it's disgusting, it's offensive, and it's bewildering, and it's really traumatizing because in a lot of our poverty, uh, we sell our own selves to make money. We do that through our media. We do that through our sexualization, our advertisement, our music, our going to the bar looking for a rich person so we can marry up, We're prostituting ourselves um, in our uh, workforce where we're not being treated um, reverentially as we ought to be honored. And so we are prostituting our skills because we're really there only for the paycheck and we are um, treated badly. So there's different ways that we sell ourselves. It's not essentially, uh, you know, human trafficking branded on your forehead, okay? But it has connections to human trafficking. And so um, we want to come out about this. Now, myth number one is that human trafficking statistics that are out there in the open source, open source social science media commons, pardon me, commons meaning Twitter or Facebook, 
or your local news. Open source social science media commons that suggests these are your stats. The myth here is that okay, human trafficking stats are reliable and based on sound methodology research. Untrue. I have heard that it's a $3.5 billion industry. I've heard that it is a $8 billion industry. And I've also heard that it's a $9 billion industry. And all that is configured by what has been reported, not essentially what is suspected as underreported. A lot of human trafficking rings are underreported. And I can go and get, get into that specifically as we're going on into this lecture. Human trafficking has a social trend, which is very sickening at this point. And it's happening in, in political climate uh, areas of the globe, where there's, uh, you know, uh, cocktail parties, things like, uh, you know, mentioning, uh, oh, this is my independent research. This is what we've published. And somebody says with their martini in their hands, uh, you know, what is uh, your methodology? I love that. And you, uh, the researcher, let's say, uh, says, oh, well, I referenced that from uh, this organization, from this document. And so you go into the document and there's no record of the methodology that was used. And so what debunks a lot of these statistical databases claiming certain stats that are publishable is the insignif insignificant case study undocumented methodology. And the methodologies out there are not clear. And the methods, the research tools that are being used in order to reach your fact findings and your data collections. So um, there's been a gold estimate coming from um, one organization, and that is in 2012, this was a $20.9 million industry. Well, I've heard up to $8 billion industry. So where, where do you find out that it's a non-substantiated methodology. This is of keen importance to uh, to consider when you are getting in a, a, a huge amount of propaganda and even uh, new source media depictions on the devastation of human trafficking in our modern society. Myth number two is that um, most victims are trafficked into sex trade. And that, that myth is mantled upon the classic child abduction or um, pimping out the girl with, with a black pimp in uh, New Jersey or Chicago. Um, we've had such a hyposexual culture that the focuses have nearly been sex, 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 sex. Human trafficking is very heavy in labor. Trafficking is not only limited to children that are, are being kidnapped, but one site was a group of homeless men and I'm getting chills up my body because it's unheard of. Because the, the manifestations of human trafficking crime are very unique right now in history. That a group of homeless men were trafficked into becoming field workers, like Mexicans in the fields. And they were, um, con they were conned into picking tomatoes off of vines, and they were paid. They were told they would be paid, but they were paid with crack. This happened for many years. And the criminal justice specialists and um, 
the attorneys coming into this did not make it a lawsuit against the owner of the land, the property owner, but ended up, you know, creating a water bill or a water policy to clean up the water because the water was very polluted. But things like that are not getting the right justice. But this had nothing to do with sex. Right now, we have had a culture that has become desensitized on believing that human trafficking is limited to girls in Russia and girls in Indonesia, which is true, it still happens to this day in Asia. And they illegally come to America, they have their green cards, and they think they're going to get work. Right now, the, the social trend is to have these people come, girls, boys, come to America on visas, legal, become kidnapped in America, and the government and no reports are needing to be um, following this person because this person came on a visa. And so they're lost. And there's drugs, there's sex, and their slave labor. So visas are good for, of course, international students, exchange students, traveling abroad. But this is the tainted side to your visa, if you have a visa. It's also immigration gone bad, is what we have here as well. And that is co-joined with um, labor and exploitation. We can, as a collective consciousness, or might I say an ethical welcoming collective consciousness, initiate an urgency among anti-human trafficking advocates, okay, regarding labor being a major issue, as well as sex trade or virginity trade. And reach a democratic consensus where laws are being made. But the issue here is that that does not initiate an urgency, and we're trying to initiate the urgency, but it somehow is not computing to Congress, the United House of Representatives, and the Department of Justice to take that law and from off of the, re the, the relevant basis it encompasses, create new sound progressive labor laws, okay? This is something that can help bring cease and bring a halt to things like human trafficking and the labor exploitation. It's a very sincere issue that we are up against. Myth number three. Now, in the exploitation and the state-imposed uh, forces saying that, I mean, one statistic was that it's a $2.2 .2 million industry. Somehow we're supposed to believe, myth three, that law enforcement and criminal prosecutors are successfully combating this. For instance, U.S. government prosecutors are getting away with saying that federal trafficking cases in 2012 with prosecution had a total of 128 in America. I mean, when this is a whether it's a 2.0 million or a 20.9 million or a five point something rather billion industry or a nine billion industry, the, the, um, the numbers are completely out of balance with what the reality would be. How can you say that there's a total of cases prosecuted 
of 128 in 2012. That's rather literally low, isn't it? When human trafficking has always been very high in New Jersey, Florida, Chicago, New York, Las Vegas. Right now, it still exists, of course, on the East Coast, but it's reduced quite a bit. And this has been the first year, 2013, where human trafficking has been on the California ballot for voters. And as of 2013, the highest statistics for human trafficking in California is San Diego and San Francisco. But Los Angeles was not mentioned. It's because the Chinese and the Chinese money are cleaning up Los Angeles. Downtown LA is looking much better. You have to have money to even live in Hollywood, parts of Hollywood. Hollywood is being cleaned out. The crime has lowered. But human trafficking is very high in Los Angeles by my own independent research and what I have found in, as a scholar practitioner. And of course, Burbank being the capital of pornography. So we have some incongruencies. It was also mentioned by a global law enforcement database that in 2012 in the world, there was 7,705 cases calculated through all countries of self-reports. And now there's three different tiers that are used to measure the crime. And the third tier is where it's certain that it is human trafficking. And I'm not going to go into the, the other tiers right now because I don't have the time. But the funds by the U.S. is concealed. until it reaches the third tier where funding is distributed. Now, actually wait, if three, if, it, if the country, pardon me, if the, if the, this is new information coming to me too, and I'm just kind of working through this with you. There's a, there's three tiers in a country. And if it reaches a third tier where it's absolutely human trafficking, the country normally receiving funding from the U.S. becomes halted. The, the funding becomes concealed and the country cannot be allotted that funding. So the countries don't want to report their human trafficking because they don't want to lose the funding from America. That's the way that goes. 46,570 identified in the world. And the source comes from Department of State Trafficking in Persons Report in 2013. That's still very low. See, the countries don't want to expose the human trafficking. So to say in myth three that law enforcement and criminal prosecutors are successfully combating this is completely untrue. Myth number four, there is no forced labor in the U.S. That's untrue. In a world of um, horrible justice systems and the West, America having the finest justice system in the world, we are brainwashed to think that there's no forced labor, and there is. New Jersey, ages 7 to 15, from West Africa, there were two girls that were kidnapped into New Jersey. And they were brought to a family human trafficking ring, and it put them in a hair braiding salon one of the women was raped by the sons of the family. This um, business that was owned by the family of hair braiding, 
made nine million dollars because of the slave labor. These girls coming from both Indonesia shows that there's an intersection with sex and slave labor among girls. No buddy that was getting their hair braided would ask, do you like your job? Where are you from in, in, in Indonesia? Do you have citizenship? Are you going to go to college? What do you want to do with your life? Are you happy? It's because people are not trained to see human trafficking. They don't want to believe that it exists when it does. Interestingly, devastatingly, hotels have always been known to hire ex-felons, putting them to work with um, gardening, um, some house cleaning, but um, you know, doing, um, uh, you know, tasks that nobody would want to do in the hotel industry. And, um, you know, breaking down tables at banquets and, and getting involved with, with, with housework, uh, for an operation at, at like a Ritz Carlton hotel. Hotels have also been known to attract human trafficking. There's a hotel that was accused of slave labor in Kansas City, Missouri. And it was slave labor. It's hard to, it was a very upscale hotel. And it's happening in hotel chains as well. And the gardeners, the house cleaners, the housemen, um, people working in banquets are not getting paid. It's very shocking. And a lot of accountants and lawyers are used to get specialized workers to be doing these these heinous jobs in an Amer in America. One hotel in, in November 2012 in Boca Raton residence had pled guilty to holding 59 Filipinos hostage. In Arizona, Flagstaff, there was a wedding dress boutique of sewing gowns and it was called Sweet Nothings Lingerie. And there was free labor among the girls and the girls were getting raped. It's pretty sad that in America that thinks that they focus on family values, that a wedding shop sewing dresses using slave labor has such a devalue to a girl walking in, a woman, whoever, to get her wedding dress to make a special day for her. That which this activity is happening to produce these wedding dresses and their sexual exploitation. Myth number five. Victims of human trafficking are being rescued. In 2010, a thousand kids under 18 were arrested for prostitution and commercialized vices. 82 82% were girls, 11% were under 15 years old. 
105 children have been rescued, but there's no follow-up. So have they, already, have they already really been rescued or recovered? When 150 suspects were arrested. So is there really rescue happening? See, we focus on children, and in a human trafficking ring, our law enforcement, they've become more educated in cultural studies today, but in the past, and it's still happening today, unfortunately, they call the children child prostitutes. When these, pro when these children have been kidnapped, have been used into slave labor, and the children are getting arrested before the adults that are manufacturing this human trafficking atmosphere. There was a boy that went to a man's house in America. And I'm not going to tell you the specific area. The boy was hired to do services for the man. This was an underage boy. And after the sexual service was satisfied, the boy was thrown out into the streets without pay. The boy started throwing rocks at the house and the boy got arrested as a male prostitute. But the man did not get arrested. The kids right now are not being put in detentions, juvenile detentions specifically, among other children because the issues are so specific to a different social psychology than somebody breaking into a house, okay, or somebody, um, you know, shoplifting, okay, or, you know, drugs. So the kids are put inside psychiatric hospitals, and these kids are called child prostitutes. These kids are put in psychiatric hospitals. See, there is a degradation of what we do with the victims. And this is happening in America. So the myth of children being rescued doesn't hold up. Myth number seven, all human trafficking victims come into the U.S. illegally, back to the visas when it comes to labor, sex labor, or uh, uh, slave labor. It's the J-1 Visas Exchange Visitor Program that establishes exploitation because the kids are coming into America illegally and then they're kidnapped. A Russian girl came into America and she was stripped by cheetahs on the strip. This was her work, and it happened after she came into America on a visa, and her whole life, she wasn't getting paid as a stripper. So she was put into like a gentleman's club or something rather. So myth seven, these human trafficking victims coming into the U.S. illegally, it doesn't hold up. Myth number eight. All trafficking is controlled by the Mafia. Martina Vanderberg, the, the woman, I hope that you can see this. One moment. I hope that you can see her picture again. Pardon me. Her work as an attorney, in all of her cases that she's represented, very few have been out of mafia. The purchase price, the working off debt is an issue that is not even situated 
predominantly by mafia. See, a girl sells her body and she's been purchased with a price, okay? And after she works off the debt by, by her body being sexually exploited, she then is moved to another area of the country or even another part of the world where there's expenses that were put up to get her there. And she's told that she has to work off that debt all over again after she worked off the first debt. And this is an underage girl. She knows nothing about finance. She knows nothing about credit card debt. And so she's sold out to another human trafficking lead that manages her and she is obligated and forced to continue selling her body. This is not even led by mafia. The girls that are sold into virginity trade, it means they're virgins and a certain amount of money can be made off of them. If their bodies are still tight and they haven't been used up like a hoe, okay, they will still be sold in the human trafficking rings because the body still is virginic and money can still be made off of her being a virgin even though she's not a virgin. So that is not predominantly led by the mafia either. A lot of human trafficking happens in mom and pop stores. It could be the hair braiding. It could be the wedding stores that we've talked about. It could also be sweatshops. The gap is not even uh, relinquishing certain documents. Their attorneys are, are writing a whole different report than what has been um, um, required by them, by you know, by 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 governments. So even corporations need to be held accountable for these problems. There was a um, Corella domestic servitude case, and the feds busted a very evil slave mistress in New York City. It's the U.S. versus Sabahani. And she had two girls from Indonesia, and one had ears stretched like a pig. <laughs> being brought off to uh, to um, a slaughterhouse, okay? And the ears, every time the, girls, the girl did something wrong, the ears would be stretched. So when law enforcement investigated her, they noticed this damage underneath the ears, and it had never been there before in any type of uh, human that they had, uh, you know, investigated and searched. For, for abuse and evidence. And one of the girls had escaped and she went to Dunkin' Donuts. And the woman behind the counter noticed something very unusual about the patches of ripped clothes on her, on, on her dress and, and on her, just all of her clothes. It was like beyond Annie Warbucks. It was beyond a Cabbage Patch doll. Her clothes had been ripped. It was like a quilt that was ratted. And it had to be sewn back. And then it was ripped again and sewn back. And the, the investigators went to Duck and Donuts. And they asked her what, what her clothes was about, what the narrative about behind this was. And she said that whenever she got in trouble, the mistress would tear my clothes and put me in the room and make me sew back my garments to keep me busy. And then when I would go out of the room to do my chores and I got in trouble again, she would rip my clothes out of anger and she would make me come back to my room to sew it. And this was, this was, this is what she did. So the manifestation of human trafficking is very unique very strange, like we've never seen before. 
And at first glimpse, you don't know that it's human trafficking, but the investigation is showing that it is human trafficking. One of the girls was, uh, was in the house and when the investigation occurred and they opened up the refrigerator and they found like all these red hot chili peppers and they were like, I think in vinegar or alcohol or something like in jars or something. And the investigator says, what's this about? And the girl says, oh, well, when, when we've been bad, uh, mistress, she makes us uh, put as many of these in our mouth and then we throw up and we become sick. And this was the torture that this mistress was doing in New York City. Um, I think that even happened in a house in uh, Mootslawn Town in Long Island. And these houses are very suburbia. It wasn't the New York mistress, I don't think. But these are huge manifestations that are beyond uh, sexual brutality and humiliation. It's not, this is nothing to be joking about. Myth number nine, all human trafficking victims are kidnapped. It's untrue. It is simply immigration gone bad with visas and ideals that we're going to be getting work and we're going to become taken care of in America. One thing that I think um, that needs to be held accountable to this is the Hollywoodized and the fairy tale Cinderella stories. It's that, the, you know, if I keep uh, cleaning the floors out of my bucket, you know, my prince in shining armor is going to come rescue me. And these girls think that if they come to America, that if they engage in cleaning and making honest money, their prince in shining armor is going to come rescue them. And that isn't the case. And so I believe that Babylon Hollywood, so to speak, has this responsibility because people want to come to America to find the wealth in Hollywood. And so these depictions of glamour and the Walt Disney and fairy tale delusions have gotten these women, um, yes, kidnapped, but also over here on legal visas. Myth number 10, there is nothing I can do to end human trafficking. You can telephone National Human Trafficking Resource Center, 888-373-7888. Think that is the number. If not, you can search online for it. If you're in a place where you don't have access to the internet, tell somebody like at Dunkin' Donuts or at a store or, or someplace so they can call the police officer so they can help you. One case that was in Orange County, specifically Irvine, was in a very, very affluent area of mansions. And you know where there's uh, grass g growing between properties and you can kind of see through the glass and you can see into the next property? You can maybe even look into the window? Well, there was a woman in a mansion and looking in, outside her window at one in the morning through the sprinkled glass, or grass, the spiky grass, pardon me, and she saw into a kitchen of the, of the mansion next to her. And she saw this very young girl doing the dishes. 
and she looked very tired. And so the property owner that was witnessing this said, I know they have kids next door and I've seen the kids go to school, but I've never seen this girl. Strange. So the property owner called the law enforcement and the law enforcement began an investigation, knocked on the front door of this mansion and said, do you have children? Oh yes, we have five kids, the father said. Well, do you have any others? Well, we have another one, but she's a distant relative and she's from another country and she's just here for a short period of time. And so the detective says, well, can we look into this? Can we go into your house? And, oh, sure, why not? And the investigation finally discovered that this little girl working inside the kitchen at 1 a.m. doing the dishes was there for slave labor. And she lived in the garage in this large mansion. She didn't live in a room with, with the other kids. And she was required to wash her clothes in a bucket because she was dirty and not allowed to use the family washing machine and dryer to dry her and wash her clothes. And she had to be penalized and punished. See, the human trafficking, it breaks down the human ego and it makes the person so paralyzed that they have no other train of thinking but to be doing the slave labor. And this happened to this very underage girl. And you could think about the psychological damage that this does to the child during her early formative years. This is real on the cutting edge research. And some of the research is around safe harbor and labor laws and to advocate for trafficking victims because of labor being an issue. We want to vacate prostitution and drug crimes, but the prostitution and the drug crime hinges on the visas and the labor. One victim had 87 prostitution criminal convictions and what what the criminal justice system has been doing is try to wipe out all of the prostitution criminal convictions so that the person can gain work after they've been rescued from these human trafficking rings. Because with so many counts of prostitution, it's impossible to find work. So we have attorneys that are trying to do work in trying to advocate in vacating the prostitution and the drug cr criminal histories of these victims. The great driver of human trafficking is corruption and the cops taking bribes and there not being enough labor laws and the Department of Justice not insisting on a more concrete analysis to enact more labor laws through the advocacy that we are laying down for people. The thing is, is in our culture, we are not looking at the groups of homeless men that are being trafficked and being paid using crack. We are not looking at the wealthy and somebody who has very ragged clothes that they end up in Dunkin' Donuts or 
the braid shops or the the sweat shop stores sweat for sweatshirts we or the hotels or the restaurants we think that this forced labor does not exist in America this sex industry has a huge architecture with law enforcement that is trying to end the sex trade and a sex crime but it's not happening in the labor industry like it needs to we need an entirely new group of informants if you suspect something call the police hold the police accountable because the police are very vulnerable another issue for my independent research is the LGBT communities and the LGBT communities are being kicked out of their house the the Huffington Post did an article and this was November 2nd 2013 and a kid was thrown out into the streets I don't know the age, probably under age 21. Family learned that he was bisexual. Stepmother becomes very angry, throws him out on the street with no car, makes him homeless with no food and no clothes. Right before that, the father says, come back in a couple of days, you can pick up a couple of clothes. So, this, so this, the child, the son, comes back to the house next couple of days to get his clothes. The stepmother calls the police to get him arrested. The father said, you know, your mother's being a bitch. Let me give you your clothes. The mother calls the police and uh, the police show up and the police escort the child back into the streets with a pair of clothes that the father gave. intermittently simultaneously the, the the kids friends on the streets set up an account for him and raised fourteen thousand dollars so the kid could have housing homeless shelters in New York City that are dealing with LGBT don't have the capacity to handle all of them and they say that we don't care about this select social population that has a unique social psychology these kids in the LGBT community specifically male youth are doing a thing called survival sex they're they're getting drugs they're giving drugs to their clients to get money to eat so and there's this survival sex that is intermingling with that type of crime we need as an LGBT community to come out of this and to address the myths and to educate people and what I am calling social justice education. We need more lawyers. We need more whistleblowers. See, like I mentioned, you can make the law, but you can't force the United States Department of Justice to have the political will to take action and so it's it's true that if you want to change Washington DC you change it from outside of it so in your town wherever you live raise awareness create discussion don't be afraid to talk about this uh, we need a coalition of workers. There's things happening in Florida. There's not a lot that I can see that I would like to see happen in in other places. Right now, statistically, human trafficking in the U.S. November 2013 is the highest in Houston, Texas. This is huge. You would have never thought. Human trafficking is very high in Berlin right now. It's very high outside Paris. 
Um, there's truckloads of men that are boarding planes in America, going into Thailand, going into countries, and, uh, you know, the sex trade and the human trafficking and the male prostitution is all linked into the economy because it's it's dealing with travel and tourism and it's it's figured into the economy and the governments don't want it to be revealed. So at the grassroots level there needs to be an ethical welcoming collective consciousness. We need creative prosecutors We need world investigative labor recruiters that can see through this dark component of visas and everything, and the men getting away with their crime. Most of the lectures I've heard that lecture on this are women, one specifically coming out of Columbia University on the East Coast. And I, I asked Martina Vanderberg last night, At the lecture, I says, I says, I want you to address for for us that in gay law and gay democracy, and men that love men that are experts on men, are not coming clean about these issues, and they're turning a blind eye in the midst of gay men that have age discrimination working against them when they're not young anymore and they don't have money. Nobody wants to be with them, and then there's this pedophilic undertone. Um, since 2000, 9-11, in fact, um, you know, clergy knows that they can't get away with crime um, among underage kids, so they're infiltrated into the gay culture to get their rocks off. Um, one of my research uh, tasks was to go to an adult chat line, and within five minutes, I found two, two priests one being a um, Franciscan priest with the brown robe, with, with, the, with the rope. And there's a lot of father and age play, father, son, rich daddy, and that kinkiness has very incestual ties to biological fathers, as well as things like um, clergy abuse. But clergy has been known to contribute to human trafficking. And so Martina Vandenberg said, well, what we need to be doing in LGBT communities is we need to be opening up discussion about the male sexuality. See, this is what it is. I, I've, 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 I've pointed it out. Well, I mentioned male sexuality more than she did, but um, you see, the reason why men aren't lecturing about this, and I, I question why aren't men lecturing about this, because it's a men's issue, is because men get erections and they lead and think with their dicks. And they, they can be very honorable men, but their hand gets caught in the cookie jar and they have dirty little secrets. And because they think and lead with their dicks and they get themselves in trouble, they don't want this crime of human trafficking to be revealed because of the shame and the disgrace. Many in the system worship men with money because of cock and power and greed and corruption through the money system. The culture endorses a getting rich and being selfish and sexually liberated and being born to buy and to not feel insecure about placing value on what you could show you own in order to get other young boys interested in you so you could molest them. Maybe not you particularly, but I'm speaking as an existentialist. I'm speaking you as a global, as a unified society with these, with these, uh, with these tainted problems. Men are inadequate and they're arrogant with their money. And when you or I, okay, in, in this work, expose human trafficking and we're using the LGBT that has done 
behaviors that condone human trafficking and have links to human trafficking. And we need LGBT homeless shelters to house these youth. And men aren't coming forward about these issues. It makes a, a, a large movement of men ex, ex, expose the ugliness of a gay culture. It, it, it forces us into doing this. And human trafficking has direct links to the gay culture, to the pedophilia. Um, in my research, I investigate the Bazi Bazi. They're the dancing boys in Afghanistan. And world uh, economists and wealthy businessmen uh, come to these parties in Afghanistan. And the, the money is infiltrated through drug lords. And it's a larger problem than uh, terrorism. And on the days off of law enforcement in Afghanistan, they wear their, their nice clothes and they go to these parties. And the richest man at these parties pimp out the little boy. Some of these boys are kidnapped. When they want to get out, they get murdered. They're more preferred than girls because they become perpetrators. And they're the ones that hold out to the cultivation for another generation of young men that will continue this ancient ritual of Bazi Bazis and human trafficking and predator and perpetrator society. And so the homosexuality component and the pedophilia component is a very major thing that when we break down all the myths and we look at a specific select social population of the Bazi Bazis and we look at the, the, um, the exploitation okay, of men, fathers to sons, and the pedophilic undertones. And um, it's alarming that um, the Bazi Bazis said in a report that our safety was more guaranteed before 9-11, before what America has been doing to the Middle East, Iraq, and, and all of the above. And so because the pressure has been put on the boys, and so um, the boys are dressed up like girls. They are wearing makeup. They're transgendered. And this is a direct link to LGBT communities on the West in America. And so we have a social responsibility as men to unearth how ugly this really is among us men and to show that we must shake the foundations of the gay culture. Okay. This needs to be a, a very seriously understood topic. Now, in a men's movement and a male psychology post-feminist movement, there's been a huge emphasis on liberating men that have been victimized by post-feminism men that never had a voice, even men that have been separated by their wives and separated by their children. And the wives getting divorces makes it very profitable for her as well as the attorneys in the criminal justice system. And the men are separated from their children and they're incarcerated. They lose the deed of their home, they lose their car, they lose everything. So there's a men's movement that's very against women that are very bitchy and very cunty, okay? The men's movement, as you start examining the human trafficking, the men's movement is really uh, around human trafficking and putting an end to, to all of this. So I want you men to not be afraid to know how to look around, okay? Pardon me. Look around and see the connections in culture to human trafficking. See the culture of women, how the women, they, they, they send off their kids because the woman wants money and the woman wants a house. And the father talks the woman into it. 
and the family human trafficking rings and the kids being uh, kidnapped or the kids being uh, pawn, pawn, pawned off, uh, uh, being purchased because a family wants money because they're in dire poverty. And so they are transported to a human trafficking family ring. Um, and how men play a role in that nuclear family that allows that to happen, allows the woman to, to go for it. Uh, you know, the, it's, this is a men's issue. And more men need to be publishing articles about this. More men need to be lecturing about this. And uh, please, um, I'm not trying to get members to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I, 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 but, you know, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, but I'm working as um, an advocate uh, for gay men and straight men against human trafficking. I am um, working as an anti-human trafficking advocate to, to bring cease to human trafficking. I'm an anti-pornography advocate. Uh, I'm an advocate against pornography. I'm an advocate against drug use. I'm an advocate against sexual violence and sexual perversion. And as men, we need to realize that being a true man and being masculine, okay, and being a man of our word and, and uh, being forthright in a men's movement is to look at this specific issue.